Hello adventurers, welcome to Singapore. Today, we'll be exploring the less known wild side of Singapore. We're covering the rich animal life of Changi Beach at low tide. As the tide recedes, revealing the intertidal zone, a whole new world opens up. Meet one of the residents, the sea cucumber. Contrary to its name, this animal is not related to cucumbers. Characterized by its bulbous body and radial symmetry, they are closely related to sea stars and sea urchins. In a glance, we don't see much, but observe closely and you'll find an extraordinary creature. The most fascinating part about them is their oral tentacles that they use to filter food from the ocean. Each arm gracefully waves in and out as they feed. Can we eat them? Well, for the vividly colored ones, it's better not to, because those bright colors are usually the sign that they are nasty to eat. This particular type is collected for food, and it's got a delicious name. It even comes with a fork. Next, meet the sea cucumber's close cousin, the brittle stars. Its name comes from how easily it breaks off its arm to get away from predators. Just like how a lizard will drop its tail when trying to make an escape. Here, we found some coral star symbiotic relationship in action. While the coral provides the star shelter and a place to feed on, the star cleans off any debris that may be stuck on the coral to let the coral have more sunlight. Another one of the Echinodom cousin is the sand dollar. Unfortunately, it's not real money. Their name originates from how they look like a dropped coin on the beach. They are actually flat sea urchins. Although they look very much immobile, they are actually fully capable of moving. All around their body are these movable spines called cilia. Each cilia is able to push out seawater such that the coordinated movement of all the cilia help the sand dollar feed, move, or even flip themselves. Just very slow. Next up, the gastropods. In simple terms, these are the slug-looking shelled animals. This is a bundle of freshly born snails. Some of these snails grow very beautiful shells. Their shell is very important for them. Not only it keeps predators away, it also keeps moisture in. The more peaceful herbivorous snails mind their own businesses and graze on algae and seagrasses. But there are also these predatory snails. They will hunt down other creatures like clams and drill into their shells and eat them alive. Some others scavenge the readily available things that washes ashore. Snails have the most exotic eggs. This is a sand collar. It's a mixture of sand, mucus, and egg of the moon snail. And these hard plastic looking capsules are the eggs of a noble volute. I chanced upon a newly wet pair. The groom is diligently fertilizing the freshly laid eggs. I hope they didn't mind me watching. There are also snails that have no shells. Instead of a shell, it's got leathery skin to keep itself moist. Then, the sea hare. They got their name from how they look like a rabbit. Their two antennas called rhinophores really do look like rabbit ears. So actually the sea hares still do have shells, but their shells are inside their skin. When threatened, some sea hares can release this purple ink to distract their foes, just like a squid. Usually, they will hide under the sand, so we have to be very careful not to trample on them. Okay, now meet the hermit crab. Unlike snails, hermit crabs don't grow their own shells. They have adapted to finding empty shells and then reusing them as their own shelter. As they grow, they will have to find bigger shells to move into. As you can see, the housing market in Singapore is very competitive. Did you know that barnacles are considered as crabs? These immobile crabs are commonly found attached to hard surfaces, including other crabs. They use their feathery thumb, called siri, for filter feeding. It's usually very difficult to see, but here's a good close-up. Still on the subject of crabs, meet the huge colony of sand bubbler crabs. These tiny crabs are very well known for their very unique feeding habit. They'll sift through the sand as they feed and use their mouth to create interesting fragments on the sand. The filtered sand are then balled up and piled behind them. 
as they feed, they create these interesting patterns on the sand. This is because they always keep a straight path back into their burrow for a quick escape in case of danger. The longer the tide has been out, the more extensive the sand piles are. Before the tide comes back, some of them would create a sand dome over their burrow. This is to prevent the incoming tides from destroying their burrows. At the next tide, the bubblers will emerge from their burrows and begin filtering sand balls all over again. By the way, I spent many days and nights in the beach to shoot this video, so if you're enjoying it, please give this video a like. It means a lot to me. Thank you very much. Back to the crabs, one of the most interesting thing I learned was that crabs can swim. Those with the flat hind legs are the swimming crabs. There are also these big flower looking creatures, anemones. Each of its petals are equipped with stingers filled with neurotoxins, ready to capture prey and swallow them alive. Despite looking like they are immobile, they can actually dig underground or uproot themselves to move. You can try triggering the sting cells by gently tapping on it. You will feel slight stickiness. That's the barbed sting trying to get you. And some of them glow in black light. And there's also the small version of the anemones. The zoanthids. It looks like a coloured blob, but if you look closely, you'll spot its tentacles. They bloom like flowers when the tide comes back. All these tentacles has stings, so be careful not to touch them. And here is the rarest of the anemones. <laughs> okay, just kidding. This is just a mop. One time, I also found this very interesting feather-looking creature with something wriggling under it. Turns out, it's a sea pen, nicknamed for looking like a feather pen. The wriggling thing? That's a porcelain crab that's known to take shelter with them. There are many other lucky encounters that I had. There's this stargazer fish, nicknamed for having its eyes facing the stars. This very colourful and graceful bristle worm. And this otter family. The intertidal zone is an amazing place to get close and explore our beautiful shores. When I first discovered it, I was amazed. I never knew this much wildlife existed in my backyard. At the same time, I was a little upset. There were other people who were exploring, who were a bit more intrusive. And slightly more ambitious. Some others also I find a bit cruel. I mean, I like eating fish and crabs as much as the next guy, but I just feel bad when I see those poor animals being cramped in a jar or being roughly handled. Thankfully, there are also the gentler people, whom are very respectful in exploring these wonderful sea creatures. It's nice that they are educating young children to encounter these animals with care and respect. I hope this video gave you a fresh perspective of the rich wildlife of Singapore. I highly recommend coming here to experience it for yourself. If you want to come here on your own, I have a how-to video to help you with that. Or, if you just want to get on with an expert, I will link some of the pros I know in the description below. Okay, please like this video if you'd like to see more of the wildlife of Singapore, and I will see you in the next adventure.